Good morning. When I was a younger, a younger man with younger kids, uh, I traveled a little bit, not a lot. And whenever I traveled, um, my boys usually were home with joy. And when I came back, they uh, always eyed me uh, with suspicion, with excitement, anticipation. I've always played a game with them. They always wanted to know when you left, Dad, what did you bring me? Now, when, they, when I would come home from trips or whatever, they were happy to see me. And Joy's like, hey, Dad's home. And they're like, yay, Dad's home. But they were eyeballing my suitcase and looking at me and just trying to figure out what it was that I may have. And they would ask me, did you bring me anything? And I'd be like, oh, I forgot, you know, I, 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 this time. And they knew that wasn't true. And so I'd go in and, and open my suitcase up and unpack. And surely they'd be there watching, both of them, Richard and Nathan, just waiting because they knew I was gonna bring them something. And so when we finally found the thing that I had stashed in my suitcase to bring them, they're so excited. They got their thing, dad's home. And, and I was thinking about that. And, and I, I was thinking that that's how kids act, right? That's how you're supposed to act when you're a child. When you're a child, you're supposed to expect your dad to give you things. And you're even supposed to, to you know, anticipate that. And when you see him and you're excited about him, sure you love him, but you want the stuff. But as you grow, as you age, we are supposed to grow out of that. And some of us don't. So it occurred to me this week that it is impossible to have an authentic relationship with someone when you're always trying to get something. Do you ever, you know anybody like that? It's impossible to have an authentic relationship with someone when you're always trying to get something from them, when you're always playing an angle. And I think that's one of the things that Jesus had one of the most difficult times convincing people of that as they met him and came to him, surely wanting something from him, that as the relationship matured, they needed to be willing to give something back to him. And some people weren't always interested in that. This Thanksgiving, I wanna to talk to you about that. It's a story that you've heard before, you've heard before from me, you've heard before if you've been in, in church any period of time. If you're a churchy like me, you probably, when you were a little kid, probably heard this uh, with your teacher in Sunday school, maybe on a flannel graph, you've heard it probably from pastors, you've probably heard it from people doing dramas and acting it out. It's one of the most famous miracles in the entire Bible. There are only two miracles that are listed in all four gospels like this this miracle and the resurrection of Jesus. It's important. It's one of the largest in scope. And um, it affected the number, uh, the largest number of people. And it occurred to Jesus or occurred through Jesus at a time that was inconvenient. Anybody ever been tired? Anybody ever been burnt out? Anyone ever been at the end of their rope? Anybody ever been hungry? Um, I have some friends right now who are on a diet and we were talking the other day and they're like, I'm just so sick and tired of this. I'm always hungry. You know what it's like to be hungry on purpose. You know what it's like to be hungry because you just don't have time to eat. My wife will do this at the end of the day. She's like, I'm starving. And I'm like, did you eat anything? And she goes, oh no, I forgot. How do you forget to eat breakfast and forget to eat lunch? And of course you get starving. Well, these are people that we're gonna hear today or talk about today that are so, they're, they're hungry because they didn't have time to eat. They're tired because they've been ministering so much. They've been traveling so much, staying in people's homes and, and being with people and doing ministry and they're just exhausted. They're on the verge possibly of burnout. They needed a break. They needed to step away. Jesus was also tired. Jesus had just delegated some of his ministry to his disciples who had taken off and done some of the same works that Jesus did. It was for a time, for a period of time in a specific place and for a purpose. And they were able to go out and some heal and, and some do some things just like Jesus did. But they were worn out from it. They were exhausted. Jesus, not only was he tired physically because he was 100% God and 100% man, he was also grieving. I don't know if you think about Jesus this way or not, but he was grieving and Jesus had friends and when his friends died, it hurt his heart. Some of you in here know grief. This year, you've experienced loss, and maybe this is the first Thanksgiving and Christmas season that you're spending without somebody who you love. Jesus knows what that feels like. 
Jesus had just lost a person who was very close to him, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was beheaded, which is an unfortunate ending for anybody. He was arrested because John the Baptist, well, you know, if you have studied the Bible for any period of time, John the Baptist was kind of a radical. He was uh, like an Old Testament guy in a New Testament time, right? He said what he thought. He thought what he said. He spoke for the Lord. He didn't have a lot, apparently, of social tact, and he certainly wasn't worried about saving his own skin. And Herod, who was one of the leaders who worked for the Romans back here in Galilee in the day of Jesus, had done something wrong. He had decided that he wanted his sister-in-law, and so he in turn married his sister-in-law uh, and did it in, in ways that, that just weren't right. And so John the Baptist, he called him out on it, and he said, this is wrong, you shouldn't do it. Herod did it anyway. Herod's wife, his new wife, Herodias, um, had John the Baptist arrested. Be quiet, stop talking. We don't want to hear what you have to say. And uh, she wanted him dead, but Herod was afraid to put him to death because the Jews liked him. So he was sort of being political. Well, Herod had a birthday and had some entertainment for his birthday. And so Herodias' daughter, which would have been Herod's stepdaughter in some weird way, came downstairs and did this crazy dance for Herod and his friends that Herod liked so much for whatever reason that he said, look, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Just tell me what you want. And so she went back to her mom and she's like, what in the world? He said, anything, what do we want? She said, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And sure enough, that's what happened. She got John the Baptist's head. She took it to her mom. They had won. Jesus had lost a friend. So they were grieving. They were tired. They were hungry. They needed a break. We're gonna take some me time. Jesus said, look guys, I know we've been going crazy. We've been burning the candle at both ends. We're gonna take a little time. Let's hop in a boat. Let's go to a place. There won't be many people here. And so they did. Now I find it really interesting. Two things. One, Jesus knew what it was like to be tired. His disciples understood what it was like to be burned out. They understood what it was like to be hungry. Jesus knew what it was like to be grieving. He knew what it was like to need a moment for himself but he also knows what it's like to not allow needing a moment for yourself to keep you out of what it is that God's trying to do that's much bigger than we are. And what I have seen in scripture and what I've found in my own life is that many times God does the most amazing things around us and through us when we think we have nothing left to give. So if you feel like you have nothing left to give, you feel like you're at the end of your rope, good news, you might be where God wants you right now. Now, let's pick up the story, and uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Sometime after this, this, you may ask, are the things I just told you. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him. Now, this is not what Jesus wanted to see, not what the disciples wanted to see, more work. There's more, people are coming. He's supposed to be taking some chill time, some me time, some time away, and the crowds were coming. Now, this is mentioned, this this a miracle four different times in each of the gospels. Each of the times adds a little detail and you should read each of these. If you don't know how to find them, it's super easy. Uh, just pull out your phone, not now please, or your iPad and just Google it or whatever search engine you use. Feeding of the 5,000 in the gospels, it'll bring up each passage. Each passage has a little bit more detail, not conflicting, but um, complementing and paints a better picture, a more comprehensive picture of this story. So the Bible says that when Jesus looked at the crowds, he was moved with compassion. Compassion is a word moved with compassion, means that even though he felt like he had every reason and the disciples felt like they had every reason to take a break, that he saw the crowd and was moved in his gut, physically his bowels is literally, literally what that means. And he was moved to action. So he looked at his disciples and he said, guys, this is an opportunity. And even though it's not great timing, it's God's timing. And so we're in. So Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. The crowds just wanted the stuff. They just wanted the show. Now, Jesus, knowing the crowds, put yourself in the situation. You're not Jesus, neither am I, but you can picture what it would be like to be there. You've worked hard. You've given everything you have. You're getting ready to take some time with Jesus 
to hang out and have your questions answered, to connect your best friend. Here come the crowds. Jesus didn't get irritated. The disciples perhaps whispered in Jesus' ear, all they want is stuff. They just want the stuff. Send them away. And Jesus, and this is really important, this is what I want to share with you. We're going to pick the pace up here because we have some fun stuff going on this morning. Jesus did something and taught his disciples to do something that if you and I do, it will cause a lot less confusion in our lives. It will cause far fewer broken relationships. It will increase the quality of your Christian witness and it will make life a whole lot more simple. And it's this, when Jesus looked at the crowds, he expected non-Christians to act like non-Christians and did not impose his values on them, but accepted them for who they were, realizing that what they needed wasn't a change in priority, it was a personal savior. But you and I look at the world around us so many times and we get so frustrated and angry because we expect people to act like us and have our values and vote the way we think we should and everything else, it separates us and alienates us. And Jesus with his arms outstretched, he said, hey, the timing's not great, but I love you. And his compassion demonstrated that their pain wasn't unfortunate or somebody else's problem, but their spiritual pain and their physical needs were Jesus' problem. And if you and I could embrace our world like that, to expect people who don't know Christ to act like that, and to realize that the solution isn't for them to change their priorities and their opinion, but to meet Jesus. And then for you and I perhaps to look at people's pain and say their pain is my pain and our pain, it might change everything. And so Jesus, he, he decided to do that. He went up on a mountainside, he sat down with his disciples, and the Bible says the Jewish Passover was near. Now, we're gonna almost certainly be in this passage, this section of scripture for eight weeks together in the spring. And so I'm trying to not dive into every single little nuance and point this morning and give you eight weeks worth of messages in 30-ish minutes. Uh, but this is one of those things that you're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about in the spring. So make sure you come back next week and then also in February, okay? When Jesus looked up and he saw this great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, who must have been the administrator, Pastor Dan is a person with great faith. He calls himself the dream killer because when we as a staff say, why don't we do this? He's like, we can't possibly do that. It's his job. It's not a lack of faith. He looks at the logistics. Well, Philip was probably the administrator of the group. And Jesus looked at him and he might have asked him because Philip was in charge of logistics. He also may have asked him because Philip was from around those parts. He looked at Philip and he's like, hey, these people are hungry. Now in another gospel, it says that the hour was late. It says very late. It says the people were hungry, really hungry. And he says to Philip, how are we gonna feed these people? And Philip looked at the crowd, looked at his bank account and he said, we can't, it's impossible. Now the need is too great. We can't do anything. So we should do nothing. That's what Philip said. Now it's easy to be judgmental and to say, how could a person who walks with Jesus have that little faith? But Philip looked at the need, which by the way, can be viewed as opportunity. And he said, because we can't do everything, we should do nothing. Jesus let them fend for themselves. In fact, Jesus, if we went into the bank account and we tried to meet these needs, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to even have a bite. Now, the Bible says that Jesus asked him this because he was trying to test him, but Jesus went to another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And Andrew said, hey, I found somebody. I found a boy, a little boy. And this little boy, he just has some crackers and some sardines, a poor person's lunch. Now, I wonder how he found this guy. I really wish we could have been there. Friends, this is the least churchy. Uh, it's real. This really happened. Could you put yourself in this situation? You're hanging out with Jesus. All of a sudden, you got a problem. You're hungry. They're hungry. Jesus looks at you and says, solve the problem. You're like, Jesus, come on. I can't solve the problem. Philip's like, no way. Andrew at least is gonna try to solve the problem. So he looks through the crowd. Now, have you ever looked for something that you didn't wanna find, right? You're looking, ah, you look around. You know, I don't know if he just did that. 
if there was some little boy there who had a little sack of lunch and was trying to hide it. If he asked people, he's like, hey, who's got some lunch? But what happened is Andrew comes to Jesus and he's like, I got this kid, this little kid who had a good enough mom to pack him a lunch because the kid was gonna go see the Jesus show. The kid being enthusiastic ran to the front and Andrew took his lunch. How did he take his lunch? I don't know. Maybe he said, hey kid, you wanna meet Jesus? Give me your lunch. I don't know. But the kid gave him the lunch. And so Andrew walks up to Jesus and he's like, here, there's a little boy right here. This little boy's got a lunch here, Jesus. I don't know what you can do with it, but it's yours. You eat it because you probably need the food more than we do. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Now pay attention. This will come back later, not as a test, but as something very important. Not just later today, but later in February. Philip looked at the need and said, it's too big, we can't do anything. And so he backed out and said, I'm not doing anything at all. Andrew said, the need's huge. I'm not sure we can do anything, but hey, why don't we just do this? The little boy took everything he had, even though it was nothing in the grand scheme of things. And he said, here, I don't know what good it's gonna do but you can have it. Now, this is what Jesus loved because Jesus loved kids. Jesus loved children. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, he says it over and over again. Matthew 18, he talked about how important it was for children and for us to have the faith like a child. But I wanna show you something very important. I wanna show you in Matthew chapter 19 that in this situation, people were bringing their little children to Jesus. Now, in just a minute, you're gonna see this because we have a child dedication and this is exactly what we do. I'm not Jesus. Our church is representing Jesus together this morning, but we're bringing children to Jesus. The people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, which was the custom of the day. And the disciples rebuked these families. They said, get your kids out of here. They're keeping us from getting what we want. And Jesus got mad. And so Jesus said to his disciples, and I'm getting ahead of myself, you better let them come to me. But let me tell you why he said it first. The first thing is Jesus loves kids, loves them, loves children. Jesus loved the way kids looked at the world. He loved their enthusiasm. He loved their generosity. He loved the fact that they gave because it was just part of their nature and they didn't worry where things were coming from. He loved the fact that they were on the front row ready to go, even though they didn't know what they were doing. And he used them as examples all the time. He says, you think too much. You think you're grownups. You think you're adults. You think you're in control of your life. You think you have all this to offer. But unless you're like a little child, humble, innocent, and trusting you can't come to me. The second thing is Jesus loved adults who love children. Now, I gotta to talk to you about this for just a second because this will explain our church to you in a very important way. Jesus knew that parents loved their kids. You die for your kids, you probably kill for your kids, you love your kids. Jesus loved adults and he loved adults who loved their kids. We at Capital City Church love children. Children are not in our way. Children are not an inconvenience. They're not a budget item. They're not a nuance to our ministry. They're our privilege and our responsibility before God to, to help show them Jesus, to train them up in the way they should go, to be part of their lives so that they can become little men and women of God because they're the ones who not only are gonna be taking care of us, but they're the ones who are taking the gospel from us into the rest of this world that we know is so hurting and so needy. And do you know something else? Jesus didn't have a nursery or childcare. We got a couple little kids in here and you know what? These little kids are a little bit noisy this morning. And do you know why they're noisy this morning? Because they're supposed to be noisy. They're kids. Now we have great parents. On a normal Sunday, we have kids. And every once in a while, the kid's gonna make a little bit of noise in a church service. And you know what? That's okay. We don't look at the parents and go, you should really get that kid out of here because you're keeping me from getting something out of this. We have great parents. If it becomes an issue and the kid throws a full on fit, 
Of course, they'll take them out and they walk them, but the kids are not an afterthought. They're not an inconvenience. And Jesus kept telling the disciples and showing that he loved adults who loved kids, that we love kids. Jesus also knew that all people matter to God. Now, kids were expendable, disposable, not in a throw them away kind of way. They just weren't counted very much. They were just sort of, until you grow up and can contribute, you're not really that much of a factor in society. Jesus had absolutely no uh, interest in that perspective. Jesus valued these children and considered them to be equally as valuable as anyone else. And then finally, Jesus was upset at his disciples because he was tired of his disciples deciding who could and couldn't find him. They were an obstacle or a roadblock. Now, let's finish this Matthew 19, and we're going to meet some little kids. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Now, the word here for children and the word here in Matthew 19 for people bringing children to God. I need you to pay attention to this because you're going to get this. And I think you'll understand the significance of this, but I'm not going to cover this at length. There are really two words in the New Testament that are used for kids. One is used for small children. People were bringing small children to God. Another word is infants, babies. And people were bringing babies and infants to Jesus. The same word was used and is used in the New Testament for living babies who have been born into this world and living babies who are still in the womb who have yet to be born into this world. The same word was used when John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb before he was born, a baby given the same respect, appreciation and rights inside the womb as out from Jesus himself. Not subtle, not insignificant, but easy for some to overlook if we try. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And then he placed his hands on them. And after he did, and only after he did, only after he did, then he went on with his business. It's so important. So let's do that now. We're gonna dedicate some babies to the Lord, some children to the Lord. This is one of my favorite things to do at Cap City Church.
And so I pray that these families, that this church, that we can be part of that plan. We can help encourage and pray for and support in every way these little ones as they continue to find their way to you. I pray for these families, for these men, women, grandparents, parents. And I pray, Father, that you would give them strength, that you would give them a supernatural ability to have patience and grace with their with their kids and their grandkids, that they would see opportunities to nudge them towards you, that they would provide for them and protect them. And I pray, Father, that you would give them that ability. I thank you for mornings like this, for times where we can acknowledge to you that you have given us the greatest gift through these kids and that we, in turn, are symbolically giving them back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we could go home now, but we're not going to quite yet. I got to finish the story. There, if you've forgotten already where we were, I just want to remind you where we were in the story. We had Jesus and his disciples who were a little tired, who thought they had given everything they could possibly give. They saw an opportunity. They were moved with compassion and they decided, even though they didn't have a lot, that they were going to give everything they had. So they engaged the crowd. You got Philip who saw a huge need. And instead of seeing this need and recognizing that every problem is a possibility, he said, no way, it's too big. I'm not interested. I'm not going to be involved. Then you had Andrew who was kind of quasi in, quasi out. He's like, yeah, I'm going to find this kid, but you know, I don't know what you can do, Jesus. I don't want you to be mad at me, but I really don't want to help solve the problem. And then you've got a child. The child reminds me a lot of Jesus back at the very beginning of this story. The kid didn't have much. The kid had a little lunchbox, a little sack, and he had some poor people food. He had a few crackers and a couple sardines. So you have one kid, you have Andrew who brought this lunch to Jesus, say it's a bagel. And Andrew says, here, Jesus, there's a bagel. I don't know what you can do with the bagel, but maybe at least you can eat because after all, you're the teacher. You need energy and the rest of us, I guess we can just watch. So Jesus has a bagel. And the disciples are watching, the crowd is watching, the kid is watching, and Jesus does something that looks crazy, but we know it's not because it's Jesus. He takes his bagel and he breaks it and he calls his disciples, 12 of them, into 12 even portions. He breaks these crackers and these sardines and gives them each to one of the disciples in their bucket and says, here you go. Here is a piece, one twelfth of a cracker, one twelfth of a sardine, put it in your bucket. And the disciples said to Jesus, what in the world am I going to do with one twelfth of a bagel in my bucket? So the disciples are standing there and Jesus literally looks to heaven and gives thanks. Now, if you're with me in the desire to be honest and transparent, I would be a hair skeptical. Let me read to you from the Bible what Jesus did. He said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. So then Jesus took these loaves, but they're crackers. They're not Wonder Bread loaves. They're just crackers. Took these crackers, broke them up, gave them to the 12. These are details that are included in the other gospels and said, I want you to take these and give them to all the people. Now, another gospel tells us they were seated in sections of 50 and 100 with aisles in between. So the disciples are standing there with a bucket and the bucket or the basket is empty except for one piece of a bagel. And Jesus steps back and looks to heaven and he gives thanks. Now, I would be wondering what in the world Jesus has given thanks about. Jesus, you just stole some kid's lunch, right? I mean, that sounds sacrilegious, but what do you think if you don't know? I mean, here you took this kid's lunch. At least his mama was a good mama and made sure he was going to eat when he went to the the Jesus show. And you took it and now you broke it up and you handed it to all of us. And now we're going to take this kid's lunch. And not only that, Jesus, but we're going to look dumb because... We're not going to walk through the crowd. I mean, how many people can we actually go to and go through with one piece of a bagel? But it didn't bother Jesus. He stopped and he gave thanks. And he gave thanks for a couple of reasons. I want to tell these reasons to you very quickly. One, because with every problem, there was an opportunity and that's how Jesus saw it. I see our world today, the world we live in, with the social, the financial, 
the political and the spiritual climate that we live in, I see it as a huge opportunity. And Jesus gave thanks because every problem provided an opportunity. Number two, because he knew that God the Father had power over problems. And we serve a God who has power over problems. Tell me the problem in your life that's too great for God to solve. And I'd ask you to let me tell you a little more about God. Number three, because Jesus knew that God the Father was gonna do a miracle before the miracle even happens. Here's what happens. The disciples had to step out and begin to do something before they had in their bucket what they needed. And they begin to go through the crowds. And Jesus did a miracle. And they passed out more food than any person in the entire crowd of 5,000 men, 20,000 people could possibly eat. The language is like they all went to the golden corral and they ate so much they had to unbutton the top button of their jeans. They were stuffed. And then the disciples went out and collected 12 baskets full of food just to represent the fact that when Jesus meets a need and does a miracle, he does a miracle and he meets a need. And then the Bible tells us that Jesus took off again because the 5,000 men who were there aren't just 5,000 random number. 5,000 was the exact number of people it took to form a Roman legion. It took 5,000 people, men, to go to war and to be scary. And the way you gathered armies at this point was as an army went for a cause and a purpose, people sort of looked at the number of folks that the army had for the cause and the purpose and decided if they wanted to follow. And so this is what could have happened, what the disciples were expecting, what people who were Jesus followers were expecting. Finally, Jesus is gonna take these guys out. Herod's going down, he's gonna pay for John the Baptist. And then we're gonna go after Rome and they had one legion. And if we just start marching on Jerusalem, more people will see, then we'll have two. By the time we round the corner and start heading up the hill, we'll have three, perhaps even four legions we can finally take over. And Jesus said, you guys are missing the point. He was worried they were gonna take him by force. And he says, guys, we're out. So he sent them to the other side of the lake again. Now there's other stuff that happens. You gotta read this on your own and come back in February, because you'll hear about it. And Jesus meets them. And the crowd comes back. The same crowd that got fed. The same crowd that saw the miracle. The same crowd that Jesus had compassion on. So Jesus and the disciples step back. This is my paraphrase. What do you guys want now? And do you know what they wanted? Lunch. That's what they wanted. They wanted lunch. Have you ever said, you know, I'm just not getting anything out of this. I just, you know, I'm just not getting anything out of this. I read my Bible. I don't get anything out of it. I listen to Caleb. I don't get anything out of it. I come to church. I sit on the front row. I did it for four weeks and I don't get anything out of it. Pastor Rick's sermons, oh, I don't get anything out of it. I need to go deeper. I need to go more. We need to do this. We need to do that. And, and it occurs to me that a child behaves like that, but that it's impossible for us to have an authentic relationship with someone when we're always trying to get something from them. That at some point, a mature person has to realize that to have an authentic relationship with Jesus and with others, that we have to be willing to give something just like this little boy. It's not much, but it's all I have and I might not get anything back, but that's okay. Because every problem is a possibility. And God is a God who solves problems, however unlikely. And so Jesus looked at this crowd and he told them who he was. And they said, and this is my paraphrase, not interested. What's in it for us? And one of the more sad passages of scripture, John 666, just a coincidence. Men put those numbers in there. That wasn't God giving it the mark of the beast or anything. People get weird about stuff like that. The numbers are put in there by man. 
not the Holy Spirit, um, talks about how that even some of the disciples who followed Jesus took off, slipped away. Well, if there's nothing in it for us, God, if you're not gonna give us the, the present in the suitcase, if you're not gonna give us lunch, then we're out. A person of uncommon faith is willing to enter into an authentic relationship with Jesus without always demanding that he give us lunch. Now, this is a hard concept, I know. But this is what I want you to do over the next two weeks. This is my challenge to you. I've been trying to do this. It is hard. And some of you will probably be like my wife and you'll argue it theologically because she's always very smart and she knows her Bible. And then some of you will probably be like my wife and you'll argue it practically and Joy's very smart and she's a lot more practical than I am. But then you'll see as my wife did that I'm right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not sure she'd concede that. Just hear me out. It took a conversation with Joy and I. Something that I've been trying to do and something I want you to do. What if you go the next two weeks between now and Thanksgiving and don't ask Jesus for anything? Well, the Bible says, pastor, here's the theological. I can ask Jesus for what I need and he'll give me my needs. I wanna give you a sermon in five seconds. The assumption behind those scriptures is that we're gonna be asking for things that are a whole lot different than lunch. But you and I spend most of our time asking God for lunch. You put me into this world, God, it's your responsibility to keep me happy, to keep me healthy, to keep me around people I like, to give me all the money I need, to bless me in every way beyond all measure. And if you don't, I'm gonna be mad at you. And Jesus is like, at some point we gotta grow up. So what if, what if the next, for the next two weeks, you don't ask him for anything. You just thank him. Now, he knows what you need. You're not gonna go without you're not putting yourself in danger. You're not jinxing yourself for any kind of spiritual retribution. You're going to reshape your perspective or your philosophy on your faith. And I've tried this this week already and it's really hard. My first response is God help me. But do you know most of the time when I say God help me, I'm not really asking him to help me with the things that he's really that concerned about. I'm asking him for lunch. So this is what I've started doing. God, thank you. Even before I come and preach and teach to you guys, I always ask God, God, help me think clearly. Lord knows I need it. Help me communicate in a way where my friends can hear. Those are good prayers, right? But today on the way in, instead of praying that, I pray, God, thank you that I'm getting to go be part of Capital City Church. Thank you that you've given me a message to share that's so cool that the only way that people aren't gonna enjoy it is if I do something stupid. Thank you for my church family. And it totally changed my confidence. It changed the way I was perceiving my morning. It will change your life if you do it. Now you can use your thank yous as a reminder to make sure God has his to-do list of things you need, right? God, thank you for giving me lunch. Thank you for keeping me healthy. God, thank you for making sure that my friends like me. Thank you for making sure I get my raise. That's not what I'm talking about. Your heart will change if your view towards your heavenly father changes. And it may take all you have that's all you need. Because it's impossible to have an authentic relationship with someone from whom you always want something. Father, thank you for my friends.